morning brothers and sisters in Christ before we begin the sermon let us come to God in prayer Heavenly Father we thank you for the privilege of hearing your word today may your Holy Spirit be our teacher and teach us your word and cause us to live according to your will we pray and ask all this in Jesus name Amen Assumptions. What are some assumptions that you have made recently? You are so sure of it, but they turn out to be wrong. Well, sometimes our assumptions, or most of the times, they are harmless and they are slightly embarrassing at most. So, for example, if you saw someone in the streets and from the features of the person's back, you thought it's your friend, right? So you run towards him or her, shout his name, and tap the person on the back. Okay, and then you realize, oh, it's actually a stranger and not your friend. And most of our assumptions may be something like this. Uh, nothing very serious. It's harmless. Maybe just slightly embarrassing. Okay, but some other assumptions may be dangerous or even deadly. Okay, so for example, most of you know of this case which happened last year. Aloysius Pang was a popular uh, media court actor. He was killed in an accident while serving his national service. Okay, when the barrel of the artillery tank that he was working in uh, squash him to death. Now there were two other NS men with him and this is supposed to be a rather routine and simple operation. Okay, but the investigation shows that all three of them assume that Aloysius would be safe. Right, He will have enough time to get up of the way. And so with that the commander activated the button to move the barrel while Aloysius was still in an unsafe position. And just in those few seconds of assumption this young man was crushed and tragically lost his life. Well, it turned out to be a deadly assumption. But then we we'll be close to what we have today in Amos chapter 2. Amos is saying to us, don't assume, don't assume you are safe. Because some assumptions can be deadly. And so recall chapter 1, right, preached by Pastor Vincent last week. Amos pronounced God's judgment the lion roars judgment on the six surrounding nations for their crimes against humanity. And in particular, five of them, right? Five out of the six, they are guilty of cruel treatment to who? Okay, if you recall, they are guilty of cruel treatment to God's people. And so can you imagine what the Israelites are thinking? Right, they are probably cheering the prophet Amos on. Right, they'll be gloating over it. Yes, they deserve it. These nations deserve it. And God is on our side. I think they must have loved the prophet Amos. And perhaps they are eagerly anticipating the next judgment. Come on Amos, who is it going to be? Tell us, who's the next vile nation to be judged? And to their complete surprise, in chapter 2, Amos is going to declare the unthinkable. It's God's people's turn to be judged. Judah, the southern, uh, southern kingdom, and Israel, the northern kingdom. So remember, at this time, God's people has been split into two divided nations. And you can imagine how this comes as a shock to them. It's a total shock. It's unthinkable. We are God's children, you know. How can God's children be judged? Now, Amos' word for them and to us today is this. Don't assume. Don't assume you are safe just because you are God's people. Because it's a deadly assumption. So let's first begin in verse 4 to 5. Don't assume you are safe if you turn away from God's truth. Don't assume you are safe if you turn away from God's truth. So in verse 4, Amos declares, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. It's the same familiar sentence, isn't it? We have heard that uh, several times in chapter 1 for the surrounding pagan nations. Only this time is directed at Judah. It's the same pattern of multiplying sin after sin. Judah has piled up sin on themselves and now God will punish them because they have reached its full limit. So in English, we say God bretan already. God says to them, I'm no longer putting up with you. Now you must remember that God is incredibly slow to anger. He patiently extends grace, but there will come a time when sins have accumulated beyond the point that God is willing to tolerate. 
And what's the sin of Judah in verse 4? It says, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes. For the surrounding nations do not know God, Judah's sin is even more wicked, right? It's even more wicked because they know God's laws, but they chose to turn away from it. They reject God himself and his character. They want nothing to do with this God and everything that he stands for, his holiness, his righteousness, his goodness. And as they turn away from truth, Judah turned towards lies. Or in NIV version, it says false gods or idols. They worship the fertility gods and goddesses of the surrounding nations with their lies, their promises, their false promises of prosperity and pleasure. And God is totally forgotten. Now today we too turn away from God and we turn to worship our false idols. What are they? sexual pleasure, money, status, and we too buy into the lies that they promise. That we can enjoy all the pleasure of sex and suffer none of the consequences. Or that with a big fat bank account or, or high social position, we can find ultimate fulfillment, we can find ultimate happiness without God. We'll be safe and secure what can happen to us. In verse 5, God's anger against Judah's idolatry reached its limit, and a fire came upon the strongholds of Judah. Less than 200 years after Amos prophesied, in the year 586 BC, okay, you can refer to the timeline of Amos here, Babylon invaded Judah and utterly destroyed Jerusalem. Now it's really the last place that they will imagine will ever fall, isn't it? God's assigned place of worship, utterly raised to the ground. Now the implication for us is this. God's people have no special immunity from His judgment. Right? God's people have no special immunity from His judgment. Calling yourself Christian won't give you any immunity. Ask yourself, are you right now multiplying sin upon sin? and testing the patience of God. Are you showing signs of turning away from God's truth? God's word is no longer attractive to you, and you're turning to your idols of sex, money, and status, and you're buying into the lie, the false promises, that you can have ultimate fulfillment and ultimate happiness without God. Now, if that is you, Amos is saying this to you today. Don't assume you are safe. Because it's a deadly assumption. Or some of you will say, wow, Sunday morning talk about judgment. Uh, topic is a little heavy, uh, and I haven't even wake up. But the bad news is that Amos has is just only getting started. Like a skilled marksman, Amos has first targeted the six surrounding pagan nations and Judah, and only now is he zooming in on his real intended target, that is complacent Israel. So that was the appetizer early on, and now we have the main course. That was the thriller, and now it's the real movie. Okay, I think you get the idea. For Israel, it's reserved the longest and most severe condemnation yet. So verse 6 to 12, don't assume you are safe if your lifestyle contradicts God's grace. Don't assume you are safe if your lifestyle contradicts God's grace. Now some background, at this point in time, Israel is a strong and materially rich nation, kind of like our nation, Singapore. And in, in their complacency, they assume that all this richness and all this prosperity is a sign of what? It's a sign of God's blessing upon them. So how can you lump us together, side by side with all these pagan nations, all these godless murderers? Now in verse 6-8, to eight, Amos paints, a horrific picture of Israelite society. It's really not too different from the surrounding nations because they are equally godless. Anything goes, it's free for all and it's a total breakdown of human relationships. Among all the nations, God's anger burns the hottest against his own children, Israel. Because of all people, they should have known God's heart or the Father's heart better. For three transgressions and for four, God calls them out. Right? God calls them out for two key sins in verse 6 to 8. 
And what are they? They are social injustice and they are superficial worship. Right? They are social injustice, they are superficial worship. Now essentially, they break the two greatest commandments. They have no real love for God and they have no real love for men. So let us go to verse 6. Verse 6 mentions the sins committed in society. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. So the greedy judges, they pervert justice. They set bribes and they give corrupt judgment in favour of those who can pay them more. So who gets away? The rich will always get away with their sins. The rich then sell the poor into slavery for ridiculously small debts. Like the, like the price of a pair of sandals. They are totally heartless and they are out to destroy the poor. Verse 7 says, They trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth. They step on the poor, right? They treat them like dirt and treat them as men who are worthless. They turn aside the way of the afflicted, right? They turn a the blind eye, they ignore those who are suffering. And look at verse 7 and 8. Notice the sins are committed where? Verse 7 and 8. At the altar and in the house of God. These are spiritual places where God has called them to worship Him. But what happens then? Man and his father go into the single so that my holy name is profane. Father and son visit the same temple prostitute participating in sexual rituals. Right where God is supposed to be. They are not just sinning, but sinning blatantly and shamelessly. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. So they confiscate the garments of the poor who owe them money. And it's a very cruel way to treat them because it's the only clothing that they possess. So they lead them to suffer. And the next moment, what did they do? They worship God, right? They worship God. They drink wine. They party. They toasted their success of being rich at the expense of the poor. And no wonder God is angry and God is calling them out. Because in reality, Israel is no different from the surrounding nations who are cruel. And so in Singlish, we say, same, same, but different, right? Same, same, but different. God has called Israel to be a royal priesthood holy nation, a light to the nation, surrounding nations, but they too oppress their own brothers and they treat people made in the image of God as what? As objects, right? As objects to be abused and exploited. And so God will have none of this superficial, fake worship because they have no real love for God and no real love for men. Now let us pause here and think for a moment. That's what Amos said to the ancient Israelites. What might Amos say to us if he saw what was what is happening in our society? What will God call us out for? Remember same same but different? Our Singaporean modern day version or equivalent might be something like this. So this is Amos chapter 2 verse 6 to 8. NDV, yeah? modern day version. For three transgressions and for four, TCEPC, I will not revoke the punishment. Because you ignore the feelings of your domestic helper, you are rude, ungracious with your words to them. You look down on the cleaning auntie and the bus driver who serve you. So recently there's an incident of a man verbally abusing, right? A Chinese uh, bus driver and posting to his Facebook live to humiliate him. You trample upon your workers or subordinates. You are stingy with your compliments but when things go, go wrong you are always very quick to blame them. You turn aside the foreign workers and the poor in the streets. They are the ones who, who build your beautiful houses but they themselves have to live in cramped living conditions. You ignore people in your school, those who are uncool to you, you practice favoritism. You worship in church, you put on a show, but at home, you vent frustration at your wife and your kids. 
you objectify women through the websites you visit, sinning blatantly and shamelessly. And in the house of God, you tithe your ill-gotten money through stealing time from your employer. And you think that God is pleased with your offering. Now, if we are honest with ourselves, haven't we also treated people made in God's image like dirt, like objects? Is it true that we are happy as long as we are accumulating riches, accumulate, um, accumulating possessions, chasing our Singaporean dream, or we brush aside those who are poor in our society? You know, when I read this passage, I feel ashamed because there were times when I would just walk past the poor man in the street right, while out shopping, and I'll think so hard, even uh, giving a little bit of money to help the person. And in my hand, maybe I'm enjoying uh, in luxury my $5 bubble tea or maybe a cup of Starbucks. You know, it's so easy to ignore people who need help. And then pretend that God doesn't see any of it. Now Amos' point is this. God, the righteous judge, the defender of the poor and vulnerable, He sees everything. He sees not just our religious life, but He is supremely interested in how we treat people around us. Right? God is supremely interested in how we treat people around us, especially those who are poor and insignificant. So don't think for a moment that how we treat people in society has nothing to do with your faith. It has everything to do with it. This is true not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New. In fact, it is Jesus himself who tells us right, that how we treat others, how we treat one another, is going to be the basis of how we are going to be judged. Right? How we treat one another is going to be the basis of how we are going to be judged. And so some of us will say, no, that cannot be right. God doesn't judge us by our works. He judges us by our faith, right? And in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 46, Jesus says this. Right? This is a short extract of the passage. Then he, that is Jesus, will say to the unbelievers, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. And then they will answer, saying, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger and did not minister to you? Um, <laughs> did, did you make a mistake there, Jesus? It's, it's not us, right? It's not us. We will never do that to you. Then he, Jesus, will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And this will go away where? Into the eternal punishment. You see, ignoring the poor and needy is as good as ignoring Jesus himself. Now the poor, whole point of this is not that good people will go to heaven, bad people will go to hell. But the genuine believers who follow their King Jesus, they follow in his footsteps in sacrificial love and care for the poor. They don't look out for themselves only, they look out for others. And on the other hand, if we are this, if we are unjust and uncaring, right, to anyone, your family members, people outside, if we are unjust and uncaring, it shows that our hearts have not been transformed by God's grace at all. Right? Our hearts have not been transformed by God's grace at all. And that's why Amos goes on to say in verse 9 to 12 that the root cause of why all this social injustice is happening is because Israel has utterly rejected the grace of God. God now turns to speak to Israel personally. Like an anguished father, he's heartbroken and he's speaking to his wayward children. So notice the number of times the word I appears. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorites. I destroyed his fruit and his roots. It was I who brought you out out of the land of Egypt, led you through the wilderness and into the promised land. I was the one who chose you and saved you from your huge and strong enemies, right? That you could never defeat yourselves. I gave you a new identity and a new purpose. And what did you do? 
you rejected my grace. God continues, I raise up some of your sons for prophets and some of your young men for Nazareth. I have nurtured you, spiritually fed you, given you my prophets and godly men to show you the way. This is not just grace, but wondrous grace all the way from the past to the very present. Is it not indeed so? God asks. But what did you do? You repeatedly reject my grace. So in verse 12, they tell the prophets to shut up, right? Shut up and mind your own business. And to the Nazarites, they, they made them drink wine to tempt them to sin. Now the Nazarites are kind of like today our brothers and sisters uh, in Christ. They come with good intention okay, to correct us for our sin, to spur us to follow God wholeheartedly. You know, maybe you should rethink about this relationship or this career decision because it may be pulling you away from God. And how do we respond to them? Don't tell us what is sin. La. Life is good. Nothing is going to happen. YOLO a bit, la, right? Amos is fake news and so are you. Now we reject God's grace. Right? We reject God's grace when we repeatedly ignore godly men and God's warning to us. And like Israel, we the church, we are the spiritual Israel, right? We have been chosen by God, saved by God, given a new identity and purpose to be the light to everyone else. We have been nurtured and spiritually fed by Him. So much grace, so much privilege. And yet how many of our lives contradict this wondrous grace that we have received? And this shows up, you know, it shows up in our injustice towards others. It shows up in our superficial worship. I think Keller wrote in his book uh, called Generous, Generous Justice. And he says this, If a person has grasped the meaning of God's grace in his heart, he will do justice, right? He will do it. If he doesn't care about the poor, it reveals that he has not really encountered the saving mercy of God. Grace should make you just. Grace must make us just. So can it be that we are unjust and uncaring because we know so little of God's grace? Because if we are known His grace and we truly love Him, there's no way we are going to treat each other like this, like dirt, like objects, and as though our feelings don't matter. Now Amos' words to us today is this, Don't assume you are saved if your lifestyle contradicts God's grace towards you because it's a deadly assumption. And now finally, you wonder what uh, Israel's response is to Amos. Far from repenting, Israel trusted in her own false securities. So verse 13 to 16, don't assume you are safe if you trust in false securities. So verse 13, God continues speaking, Behold, I will press you down, I will crush you, I will flatten you like a cut that is full and overloaded. Now this imagery, uh, imagery makes me think of the cartoon I watched in my childhood. Okay? Okay, they can be flattened, but after that they, they can get up as though nothing happened. And then they continue to disturb other characters. But here in Amos is no joke. Amos is warning them, the God of grace they have just heard about in verse 9 to 12 will become the God of hostility and judgment. He will utterly crush you. He will flatten you if you still don't turn and repent. And in verse 14 to 16, Amos continues, he employs military language, right? Military language and exposes Israel's false security in her own military power, in her own strength. Now in those days, military strength is uh, Israel's source of pride. Okay, kind of like what we Singaporeans do on National Day. Okay, like this uh, mother and son spotted in my neighborhood. Okay, that's uh, Charlie and Tedders. Okay, we are proud of our military assets. We proudly parade them in our neighborhoods on National Day. Now Israel too prided herself on having a great army and achieving great military victories. Under the rule of their king, Jeroboam II, 
Israel has extended her territory beyond their original plot of land into the land of Syria. And so you can see that uh, in, 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 in the map here, this huge piece of land that Israel conquered with their great army. What is their assumption? Their deadly assumption. We are so strong, there's no way we are going to fall. Right? We are so strong, there's no way we can fall. And in verse 14 to 16, Amos described the fate of Israel. Flight shall perish from the swift. The strong shall not retain his strength, nor shall the mighty save his life. He who handles the bow shall not stand, he who is swift of foot shall not save himself, and he who rides the horse save his life. He who is stout of heart shall flee away naked in that day. But it's a picture of what? It's a picture of utter and complete defeat. Brave men flee away. All their military assets will prove to be useless. They are totally exposed and totally defeated. Well, Amos' words came true. And the lion's roar is no empty threat. Within a short 40 years of Amos' prophecy, and this is even earlier than Judah, in the year 722 BC, Israel was destroyed by the superpower nation, Assyria. And she says to Ansys, Israel as a nation, as a mighty nation, was no more. And once again, Amos warning to us is this. Don't assume you are safe. If you are trusting in your own strength, if you are trusting in the false securities in your life. But it could be your money or your possessions that you accumulate, or your high social standing that gives you a sense of security, even a sense of invincibility, right? Or, your, or maybe it's your workplace performance, or even your religious performance in church. Look, I've served God for so many years. Surely that must count for something. Realize this. Whatever you think gives you security will be absolutely worthless on the day of God's judgment. So don't assume you are safe. It's a deadly assumption. And as we come to a close, we need to ask ourselves, in response to God's word, what must we do? Right? Let me conclude the sermon with three final applications. And we sum up with three C's. Now the first application is we must come to Jesus our safe refuge. Okay? Don't deceive yourself. Don't assume you are safe just because you call yourself Christian and you attend church and you may have a long history of being a Christian. These are the very people that God judged. Examine yourselves. Do you often ignore God's warnings okay, through His Word or even through people who come to you? Do you mistreat the very people God has called us to love? Have you trusted in false securities? Now we must quickly repent and run to Jesus. And He will forgive us. He will be to us what our false securities can never be. Right? He will be our safe refuge. Because only Jesus can shield us. Only Jesus can shelter us from God's coming judgment. Because He has borne all our sins and paid for them on the cross. So first, Come to Jesus, our safe refuge. And second, we need to change our mistreatment of others. Right? Change our mistreatment of others. So say sorry to your wife, your family members, your siblings, or your friends, whoever. I'm sorry that I vented on you just now. Or I'm sorry that I, I vented on you yesterday. If you have been unkind with your words to your subordinates, or your workers under you, working under you, ask God for His grace to change our oppressive hearts and make us just. Our lifestyle must be consistent with the grace that we have received. And last but not least, repentance is not just merely putting off the old lifestyle, but it is about living out that new life led by our King, Jesus. And so lastly, care. Care for the poor and insignificant among us. Remember God is supremely interested in how we treat people uh, around us, how we treat others. So one way we can do is to welcome them, right? If you can invite people who are neglected over for a meal, 
Or another good example of this is uh, in the past few Sundays, some of our sisters, okay, we have uh, Sister Tabitha, Grace, Chloe and Faith, okay, they have been inviting Sister Molly to go back to church okay, so that they all can have a Zoom worship together because uh, Sister Molly has missed worship for a few months. So that's a good example. Take care of those who are alone or neglected. right? Or it could just be a simple text message to let people know that they are not forgotten. To the workers who, who clean your estate downstairs, right? To the, to the person who cleans up your table at the hawker centre, greet them and don't ignore them. Thank them for their hard work and treat them with kindness, with the kindness and dignity that they deserve. So what we do, we start off by showing love to those who are closest to us and then some of us can even go beyond that. Okay, we can, for example, we can help, provide help to the needy, okay, perhaps by volunteering. So let me share with you uh, another good example is uh, our sister Faith. For a few months during the COVID-19 period, right, she used her time to volunteer at an, at an organization to assist the foreign workers. Right? So she helped them uh, answer calls, right, assist them with their immediate needs and even help them with their salary claims okay, because some of them didn't receive their salary on time. Okay, so that's a very good example of how one can uh, offer practical help to the needy. And lastly, we can even consider this, we can give generously to social organizations. And uh, nowadays we can do it so easily, right? Online, at the click of a button. So let me just give you an example. Okay, giving.sg. And I like this website because it's very transparent how you actually help people. You know, sometimes when you give money, you are not sure how the money actually help people. So one good example is this, uh, for example, for $50, we can pay for one counseling session okay, for the needy and for, for, for the one who is uh, mentally affected by COVID-19. And for many of us, this amount is just uh, uh, the price of a branded shirt, okay, another branded shirt that we don't really need. And so we can challenge ourselves. Okay? Perhaps refrain from spending this amount this month and divert this unnecessary spending to giving. Okay, whether you give it online or you give it to people you meet uh, personally. Okay, there's so much that we can do. And so as we close this sermon, remember, the lion sees everything. He sees whether our hearts are still unjust and uncaring, or that they have been transformed by His grace, and that we truly love Him, and we are following his son, Jesus Christ, in justice and in compassion. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminding us that how we treat others matters to you. But we thank you for Jesus, our safe refuge, who alone can shield us from the coming judgment and who died on the cross for all our mistreatment of the people you have placed in our lives, you have called us to love them, cause us to repent and by your grace make us compassionate and just people who will love others as how you have loved us. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.